All right, so we just finished up chapter four, okay, which looks at two types of functions. We studied rational uh, functions, and we studied radical functions. Rationals are where you have fractions, with two polynomials, one in the top, one in the bottom. And then radicals are when you have a root. With both types of functions, we looked at how to graph them, uh, and we looked at how to solve the equations. Okay. And we're going to do the same kind of thing with these. Okay, we're going to look at a little bit of graphing with exponentials, uh, and we'll talk about how to solve them. Okay, so how we solve them is actually going to tie in with section 5.4 okay, when we get to logarithms. So let's just compare those two expressions. Okay, they're, they're very different. So it's x squared and 2 to the x. In each of those cases, uh, there is a base and there's an exponent. When we look at x squared, what's the what's the base there on x squared, John? X. X and the exponent? Uh, two. Two. When we look at two to the x, the base is two, and the exponent is x. Which one of those functions do you think would grow faster? To the x. Yeah, 2 to the x. Exponential functions are uh, one of the fastest growing functions that we have. And if you're not sure you know, why that happens, just pick a value for x and try it. And plug in like 10. And then the one on the left, you get 10 squared is 100. On the one on the right, you get 2 to the 10th power. Okay, that's much bigger than 100. All right, so exponentials will grow much, much faster. So what we studied before is when you had a variable in the base and you had an exponent that was a non-negative integer. That's a polynomial, okay, like x squared, 5x cubed, 1 third x to the 10th, anything like that. When the variable is in the base and your exponent is a non-negative integer, that's a polynomial. But when you put the variable in the exponent and the base is a positive real number that's not 1, that's an exponential. Now, why do you think the base can't be 1? Like, why wouldn't something like this be considered an exponential? Julie? Because the value will change. Yeah, the value would always be 1. Even if you do 1 to the 50th power, it's still 1. So this exponential functions either grow very rapidly or decay very rapidly. We're going to talk about both types, exponential growth and decay. Uh, and the other thing is you don't want your base to be a negative. Then that starts to get really weird. All right. If you did something like, let's say, negative 2 as your base, Raised to the x, well, remember, x can be anything, all right? So if I did this, just as one specific example of x, what is, when you raise something to the 1 half power, what does that mean? Yep. Square root it means to square root it. So technically, this means to take the square root of negative 2. Well, now that's imaginary. So now that, that's kind of weird. Uh, if I let x be 1, well, I could do that. Negative 2 to the first power just means multiplying negative 2 by itself 1. So it's just negative 2. So that one I can do. Uh, but then if I do like negative 2 to the third power, that's negative 8. And then if I do negative 2 to the fourth power, now it's positive 16. So this graph is all over the place. You get negatives, you get positives, you get imaginaries. You can't even graph something like that on the calculator. Y equals negative 2 to the x. You won't even graph. Right? Because the values alternate between positives and negatives and imaginaries. So it's, it's just a mess. Yep. Why when plugged in the graphing calculator, it doesn't go all wacky? Um, because it, 
you know, I, I don't know exactly how the calculator is programmed to graph. Um, so if you put in like negative two to the oops, negative two to the x, you can see some of the things I, I mentioned. So you know, if you plug in zero, you get one. Anything to the zero power is one. If you plug in one, you get negative two. If you plug in two, you get positive four. If you plug in three, you get negative eight. So it's, it's bouncing around, but then if you do like to the 0.5 power, you get an error because it's imaginary. So I think it's because the graph just jumps around so much, the calculator doesn't even know what to do with it. Doesn't even, there's no clue. All right. And I didn't really play with a lot of decimals, but if you do 0.6, you get negative 1.5. And now 0.7, you can't even do it. And then 0.8, now it's positive 1.7. So it's jumping around so much, and I'm only changing it by 0.1. So it, you just can't even grab something like that. Uh, anybody know why you can't do 0.7, I guess? Negative 2 to the 0.7. I mean, 0.6 worked, and point, point 0.5 didn't, because that was the square root. Yep, John? Yeah, uh, John, I'm over mine. Here's a hint. It's to the 7 tenths power, right? So what that means to do is take negative 2, raise it to the 7th power, and then take the 10th root. You can't take an even root of a negative number. That's why you can't do 0.7. Negative 2 to the 7th power would be a negative number. And then you're trying to take an even root of a negative number. So basically, any fraction that you could write that has, in lowest terms, an even denominator, you wouldn't be able to type that number in. So 0.9, that shouldn't work either. And it doesn't, because that would be raising it to the 9 tenths power. You can't take the 10th root. All right, so it's, again, very weird. So we're only going to worry about bases that are positive and not equal to 1. So when we deal with an exponential, the domain for x is all real numbers. You can have the exponent be anything you want, positives, negatives, and 0. Now the range. We'll, we'll talk more about that later. I mean, the range is a little bit different. And it depends on the graph. And remember, though, here your base has to be a positive real number not equal to 1. That's what that says. A is an element of the positive real numbers, but not 1. It's not that you get an error if you let it be 1. It's just that you get a horizontal line because it's always 1, and that's not an exponential. So these are all examples of exponential functions. 10 to the x. So 10 to the x, 4 to the v, and pi to the x. Those are all different exponentials. Now let's look at some that are not exponentials. x cubed. What's x cubed? That's not an exponential. What would we call that one? Yep. Polynomial. That's a polynomial. You have a base as the variable and a non-negative integer for your exponent. Uh, g of x. That's not an exponential either. That's a polynomial. That's like the same as saying 1 half x to the fourth power. That's polynomial. And the last one, y equals, uh, that's a combination of a radical and a rational together. We never really looked at anything like that. But the point is, it's not an exponential. Any questions on what makes the top functions exponentials and the bottom ones not?
So let's look at the difference between 2 to the x and 3 to the x. Let's just graph both of them. All right, and we've got 2 to the x, 3 to the x. Let's do zoom 6. Now remember, the domain is all real, so this graph is going to go left and right forever. And let's just focus on the part that's on the left for a minute. Why, why does it get very flat on the left side for both of them? What kind of x values are you plugging in on the left side? Negative. Negatives. So what does it mean if you put a negative in for x? Like let's say you let x equal negative pi. Somebody tell me what that would mean. Yeah? It's like, uh, uh, like a decimal, I don't say it's like a degree lower. It's like, uh, Can you tell me what that would be? That one would be like it was a two times ten to the negative. No, it would be it would be like a small decimal. It would be like a very small decimal number. And how would you write that without a negative exponent? Lindsay? Just two to the one fifth power. Say it again. Is it two to the one fifth power? Um, two to the two to the one fifth would be like if you had something like this, the fifth root of two. That would be two to the one fifth power. Uh, Caitlin? Would it be one over two to the fifth power? One over two to the fifth. So what happens is when you have a negative exponent, it ends up putting that in the bottom of a fraction, and the more negative that that exponent gets, the bigger that it's going to make the denominator. The bigger that you make a denominator in a fraction, the smaller the overall fraction gets. That's why the further and further to the left you go, you are approaching zero. Will you ever reach it? No. Even, even if you do 2 to the negative 100th power, you'd have 1 over 2 to the 100th. That's 1 over a huge number, but it's still not zero. Okay. Only way you could make it zero is if there was a zero in the top, and there isn't. There's a one. Mm -hmm. So exponential functions will always have a horizontal asymptote of zero? If you don't shift them. They will always have a horizontal asymptote. Let's leave it at that. Where the horizontal asymptote is depends if you shift it up or down. But if you don't shift it, it's at zero. And then as you start to go to the right, that's when an exponential function takes off. Because now you're taking a number, especially exponential growth, that takes off. You're taking a number and raising it to a power, a positive power, which makes it bigger and bigger and bigger, as long as your base is bigger than 1. Take any number bigger than 1, raise it to a positive exponent, and you'll always get a bigger and bigger number. Okay. If your base is less than 1, that graph would look a little different, and we'll talk about that. All right. So when we're trying to analyze exponential graphs, this little trick is, is going to help us. Does everyone agree that a to the negative 1 means 1 over a? Okay. So when you look at, at this one, a to the negative x, it's easier to think about exponential functions if the exponent is positive. So I'm going to show you a trick to rewrite it. What number is between the negative symbol and the x, even though it's not written there. Caleb? Negative 1. Yeah, it's really like we have a negative 1x right there. Now, let's just write that out a little bit. Negative x, right? It's like you have an imaginary 1 right there. That's a product. Negative 1 times x. When do you multiply exponents together? Like when would you end up with a product in your exponent? If you had a, well, I think this came up yesterday. Yeah. Escalating like exponent, like exponent, exponent. Yeah. Right. If you have an exponent raised to another exponent, so this could have come from something like that. 
This is a to the negative 1 to the x. That's a power to a power. You would multiply them together and get negative x. Now, we just said a to the negative 1 is that. So substitute that in, and you get that. Okay, so what this gives you is a way to convert something with a negative exponent into something with a positive exponent. And what it does is it changes the base. Basically, what ends up happening is the base flips. Any question on, on that idea? So to convert something with a negative exponent into a positive exponent, all you have to do is take the base and flip it. And now you have a positive exponent. And that's the reason why. All right, so let's graph these. Uh, can somebody tell me how g of x uh, would be written with a positive exponent? John? Uh, 1 over 2 to the x. 1 over 2 to the x. So let's graph each of those and see what happens. I already got 2 to the x. Let's do 0.5 to the x, which is exactly the same thing as 2 to the negative x. Okay, there's 2 to the x. There's 1 half to the x. One of those is what we call exponential growth. The other one is exponential decay. So let's just see if we can kind of analyze domain and range here. Let's start with 2 to the x. Okay, that one was in blue. And 1 half to the x, perfect. That one's in red. All right. Let's look at the one in blue. How far left and right does the graph in blue go? What's, what's the domain? Nick? Negative infinity to infinity. Yep. And now let's look at the range of the one in blue. What's the lowest to the highest? Yep. Zero to half. Including zero or not including? Not. Not including. So the range is zero to infinity. Now let's look at g of x. That's the one in red. What's the, what's the domain of the graph in red? That's an exponential decay function. John? Uh, negative infinity to infinity. It's still negative infinity to infinity. All exponential functions have a domain of negative infinity to infinity. That, that never changes. And what about um, the range? Sophie? Negative infinity to, to zero, one zero. So you're saying the red one goes down forever? Wait, oh, maybe. Um, no, it's still the same. It would be the same. It's zero to positive infinity, right? It goes, it goes up forever, but it never reaches zero. So there's the domain and range of a specific exponential growth and a specific exponential decay function. But whether you put a 2 in here, a 3, a 5, a 10, they would all have the same domain. What the 2 controls is how fast it grows. And we saw that when we compared 2 to the x and 3 to the x. I don't know if I really pointed it out, but the graph of 3 to the x grew faster than the graph of 2 to the x. Yeah? So the only way any kind of domain or range would change would be in the range if it was shifted? Yes, there can never be a change in the domain, because no matter how you shift, stretch anything with domain, it's always negative infinity to infinity. But range can be altered if you shift it up or down or stretch it up or down. Yep. Okay. So now let's just kind of think about this a little bit more general. Instead of 2 to the x and 1 over 2 to the x, let's pretend that the base is any positive real number you can think of. And if you need to think specifically of the graph of 2 to the x, that's fine. But let's think first about 
this type of graph. That's an exponential growth graph. As you head to the right in a graph like y equals 2 to the x, what does your y value approach as you head to the right? Yep. It approaches infinity. Now, what does your y value approach in a graph like the blue one if you head to the left? Yep. Zero. It approaches zero. And that's true whether it was 2 to the x, 3 to the x, 10 to the x, or 500 to the x. It would be the exact same behavior. Now, let's look at a fraction with a positive number in the bottom, like 1 half, 1 third, 1 fifth, anything like that. As, so now, as x approaches infinity in the red graph, it's coming down towards the axis, and it's approaching 0. As you head towards negative infinity in a decay graph, which is represented by a fraction, as you head to the left, your graph starts to curve up without any limit. So that's also infinity. So that summarizes what happens in general for an exponential growth and decay graph. Questions on those four? So the key difference that determines whether something is going to grow or decay is, is the base bigger than 1, or is it between 0 and 1? Because if you take a number that's bigger than 1 and raise it to a positive power, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. If you take a number that's smaller than 1, like 1 half, and you raise that to a positive power, think about what's happening as you raise it to a positive power. A half times 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 a half. You keep multiplying something that's smaller than 1 over and over, it's going to get smaller and smaller. And it will approach 0. But it will never reach 0. Um, let me see. Yeah. Right. So you can probably tell, we're not going to go into the detailed reason why, but those graphs are reflections of each other over the y-axis. They are reflections over the y-axis. So greater than 1, we're going to talk about that as growth. Between 0 and 1, that will be what we call a decay graph. Questions on that? So we can transform exponentials exactly the same way we've transformed in every function all year. So I'm not going to go through in big detail here. I'll kind of write out the generic formula with the ABCD. If you want to write out what they all mean, you can. But we can have something like f of x equals, let's say, um, I don't want to, I've been using A for my base, but I want to use that for my transformation. So let's just call this the base. Um, and we could have, let's see. All right, so we could have AX plus B times C plus or minus D. Okay, let's just go through what each of those letters means. What do you think um, the A would do in this case? Because, oh, actually, oh, I'm sorry, let me switch these two and mess these up. That's D. Bless you. That's D. Sorry. What do you think the A would do in this case because it's addition or subtraction and it's inside the exponent? That's a horizontal shift. Okay, addition is all, or subtraction is always a shift and it's inside the exponent. Okay. Plus would move it to the left, minus would move it right. Uh, what about B? 
That's a horizontal stretch. B is a horizontal stretch. What do you think would happen if B was a negative number? Yep. That's a horizontal flip. Okay, or a horizontal reflection. So that's B. Um, how about C? That's a vertical stretch. What if C was a negative? What would that do? That would be a vertical reflection. And then lastly, plus or minus D, and this is outside the exponential function. This is on the, it's at the end. What do you think um, D would do? Yep. That's a vertical shift. Positive is up, negative is down. And so it works exactly the same as every transformation we've studied. Inside the function is horizontal stuff. Outside the exponent is vertical. Adding or subtracting is always a shift. Multiplying is always a stretch. Put a negative with one of the stretches, and you cause a reflection or a flip to happen. Yeah. So in this case, horizontal shift, positive is right, and negative is left? Um, for a horizontal shift, no, nope, it obeys the same properties as all the other ones. Positive is left, negative is right. So if I said that wrong, I, I apologize. But positive is always to the left, negative is always to the right. Did I clear that up? Any question on that? Okay. All right, so let's list the transformations needed to change f of x into g of x. Now, you would never compare two functions with different bases. Okay. The base here is a 3, the base here is a 3. Those have to be the same. Okay. How many transformations are happening in g of x? Start with that. John? There are three. There are three. We need to write what they are and in the correct order. So follow the order A, B, C, D. Okay, what's the first thing that's going to happen to f of x as it starts to change into g of x? Uh, so we need to describe it as a geometric transformation. No, that's a. I like the horizontal, but plus um, is not a stretch, Mabel. Horizontal shift. Right? So shift. Which way? Right. Mm. Left. left. Shift left one. Okay. What's uh, the next thing that would happen? Sophie. Vertical stretch. So vertical stretch by a factor of. And what's the third thing that would happen? Michael? Uh, vertical translation, five units down. Yep. So shift Sorry. down five. So I could give you a coordinate that was on the original graph and ask you to do this to it. So like, let's say an original coordinate would be one, three. That, that's on the original graph. When x is one, y is three. Tell me where that coordinate would end up. Well, just do each one of these one at a time. Shift this coordinate left one. Goes there. Vertically stretch it by a factor of two. So then it would end up there, doubling the y value, and then shift it down five. So then it would end up uh, down five would be zero, one. So I just applied the transformations to an individual coordinate. Yeah. Does it matter what order you do? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Kind of like PEMDAS, the same type of thing would happen. Did you start in the parentheses and then go from left to right? Um, so you always follow the A, B, C, and then D. Okay. Yep. Would you um, do the stretch or the reflection first if you were to have a negative? That part doesn't matter. Yeah, that part you can do in either order. 
So you always want to do horizontal shift, then I do horizontal stretch, horizontal reflection, vertical stretch, vertical reflection, vertical shift. That would be the order I would go in. You can switch the order of the stretch and reflection and you'll get the same thing. That doesn't matter. But if you're not sure, stick with the order that I, I just said. So questions on, on that? All right. So let's show that these two things are really the same. They look different. They're not different. And you can start with either one of them. You can start with f of x and try to change it into g of x. Or you could start with g of x and try to change it into f of x. Um, let's start with f of x and see if we can get it to look like g of x. Anybody see something I could do to f of x? And then it would look a little bit more like g of x. It's going to take a few steps. So where do, I'm sorry, where do you see distributive property? Um, when you do 2 to 3, so you get 6 on 2 minus 2x, two so you get like 4 at minus 4x. Um, so you, there's no um, distributive property that would apply in this situation. Yeah. Um, there's no way we can do any kind of distributing. But can you want to see something else? Just focus on the exponent first. Something, something little that would make this exponent look at least a little bit more like the other one. Maybe fitting more of like a pattern. Caleb? Uh, you could multiply both of them by one half. By uh, so we can't just change them. Okay. We can't do something that would, that like doesn't follow an algebraic rule. So you're gen general, you're not allowed to just multiply something by a one half because that would change your um, problem. But we'll get to something kind of on that idea. So you divide the exponent by two. Um, how about we just make the variable and the number in the right spot first, right? This one is variable number. This one's number variable. So they're not even in the same. Same order. Uh, how could I rewrite this exponent so it fits the pattern of number first, or I'm sorry, variable first, number second? John? Negative two x plus two. Okay, so at least we, let's just start with that. Now we have the variable first, the number second, variable first, number second. So that, that's good. Now, what can we do, or how can I rewrite? that exponent. I can't just divide it by something, but I can do something else. And we do a lot of this when we like solve quadratics and stuff like that. Yeah? If you put it into a fraction because it's a negative. Um, so we have one term that's a negative and the other one is positive. So since we have that, we don't know whether or not this whole exponent is negative because it depends on the value of x. So there's nothing, um, nothing I can do to turn it into a fraction. But there's something something else here I could do to the exponent, yeah? Well, uh, isn't um, a, a negative x plus 1.5 times negative x plus 1.5 equal to negative 2x plus 3? Well, like, could we somehow split that or divide it by 2 somehow, negative 2 to change it to x by 1.5? Because it is just, if you do some, I don't know how you would do that, but... So what is... Um, Instead of saying divide it by a negative 2, we could do something else with a negative 2 and this expression. We could take the negative 2 and do what with it? Yeah, Nick? Uh, 
factor. We could factor out a negative 2. And that's perfectly fine, because we're not changing the original problem if we do that. We're just pulling something out. What do you get if you pull a negative 2 out of negative 2x? You get x. And then what if you take a negative 2 out of 3? What would you have to put right here? Plus 1. Yeah, because think about if you distributed this back out. Negative 2 times x is negative 2x, and negative 2 times negative 1.5 is plus 3. Okay, so that looks a little bit closer. And now, look at what's happening here. That's 2 to the negative 2. That's my base. What's another way of thinking of 2 to the negative 2 power? Think of how could we rewrite that in a way we talked about earlier. Yeah? Isn't it one half to the second power? Uh, so it can be a fraction. What would be in the top yeah. and in the bottom? Uh, John? Uh, 1 over 2 to the second. 1 raise over 2 to the second. So that's. 1 over 2 to the second, because that 2 to the negative 2 means to put it in the bottom of a fraction. And then what's, one, what's 2 to the 2? 4. 4. And what's 1 4? 0.25. So 0.25x to the minus 1.5. So just by doing a little bit of algebraic kind of manipulation with that, we show that those two things are exactly the same. Which is important if you're trying to compare two functions and prove that they are the same. You'd have to do something kind of like that. And it isn't anything advanced, really. We just had to think, OK, we switched the order. That's the commutative property. Then we did some factoring. And then we used the rule that if you have a negative exponent, it goes to the bottom of a fraction. So they're all simple things. We just have to kind of remember all the simple things you're allowed to do to manipulate an expression. All right, this, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. It's kind of a weird thing to think about, though, especially if you let x approach infinity. Because if you let x approach infinity, what happens to that fraction I just circled? What does it approach? Yep. It becomes infinitely small. becomes infinitely small and approaches 0. So you're taking something that's infinitely small and adding 1 to it. So you're getting something just a little bigger than 1, but extremely close to 1. And you're raising it to an infinitely large power. So it's kind of weird what, what ends up happening. But if you graph 1 plus 1 over x raised to the x, it's like these two things are fighting each other. The base is getting closer and closer and closer to 1 as x gets bigger and bigger, but the exponent is also increasing. So when you graph it, what does it look like we have in this graph that we've talked about before? Yeah? Asymptote. Yeah, there's a horizontal asymptote. And it ends up that the larger you make x, the closer and closer you start to get to this number 2.718. If I go like 9,000, 2.7181. And that's actually a special number, 2.718. And it keeps going. And that number is this number. E. So E is a number that's used in math, not as often as pi, but it's the number 2.7182818288. It doesn't keep repeating 1828. I don't remember the next numbers. But it's a hor that number is a horizontal asymptote of this graph. And that's going to be a very important number when we do logarithms tomorrow. Right? So it's just kind of an interesting function that has a horizontal asymptote. It is, it is exponential. Right? Kind of fits, well, it kind of fits the pattern of exponential where you have an, an exponent that's a um, variable. But it ends up having a horizontal asymptote 
It's something that's important for logarithms. So that's why I mentioned it. Yeah? Isn't that the infinitely compounding number that they use for finance now? Yeah. If you talk about um, what's called continuous con compounding, um, interest. I'm trying to remember the formula. It's, uh, I think it's I equals P E to the RT, where you have principal, rate, time, and E is the number they use for that. So that has to do with continuously compounded interest. Yep. Not a formula that most banks really use, but uh, it is out there. So we'll, we might talk a little about that. Yeah. Where do you find E on your calculator? Um, e is under second uh, divide division symbol. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yep. So again, there appears to be a horizontal asymptote at 2.7182818281828. And that number is known as E. And it ends up being the base of what we call the natural logarithm. We're going to talk more about that in the next section. Okay, but that, that's all I'm going to say about E for now. All right, so what I'm going to look at now is the formula for what we call exponential growth. Okay, so this formula is called the exponential growth formula. P times 1 plus R to the T. And to figure out, basically, this would be an example like, let's say you had a population growing at 10% every year. That'd be exponential growth. If you got a raise in your salary of 2% every year, that's exponential growth. Anything that goes up by the same percentage over time is exponentially growing. So to figure out what the population would be for something that's exponentially growing, you need to know three things. What's the original amount of you started with? Could be money, could be people, could be trees in a forest. Right? But you have to know the original amount you're starting with. You have to know the rate of increase, and we assume a constant rate, a rate that never changes. And you have to know how long it's going to do that increase for. Is it going to, are we going to look at it over a year, 10 years, 30 years, 200 years? And that's called the exponential growth formula. Now, if you change one thing in that formula, it turns into exponential decay. So you'd use this if you had a problem like, uh, I think they usually give a problem in the book, something about like acres of forest. And they're being cut down, and we're losing 6% of the forest every year predict how much of the forest would be left in 20 years. So you'd have to write down your exponential decay formula, know how much forest you started with, what's the rate that the forest is decaying at, and how many years are we going to look at the decay for? And then we can figure it out. So those are your exponential growth and decay formulas. Let's look at an example. So the town has a population of 50,000 people increasing at a rate of 2.5% per year. Okay. It's increasing at the same percent every year. That's exponential growth. Compared to saying, let's say you add five people to the town every year. That's not exponential growth. Adding five people every year is not the same as increasing by 2.5% every year. So first, they want us to just set up an equation that will model it. And then we're going to use our uh, graphing calculator to figure out how long before the town hits 100,000 people. So we're going to write our population 
as a function of time. Tell me the population based on how much time has gone by. So first thing, initial amount. What's the initial population of this town? 50, Starting at 50,000. Times 1 plus r. r is my rate. Now remember what I said about the rate. The rate always has to be a decimal. It's 2.5%. What would that be, Caleb? 0.025. Uh, let me think 0 0.025, yes. And what's the last thing that we need to put near the parentheses to make this uh, an exponential growth formula, John? To the power of t. To the power of t. We don't know what t is. If they said how many people will be in the town in 10 years, then I would fill in a 10. That's all. All right, we can simplify that to 1.025 to the t. Okay, so we've done the first part. Now, we have to figure out when the population is 100,000. Where's this 100,000 going to go in the formula? There's two spots it could go. We have to put it in the right one. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the where the P of T is. That's where the P of T is. We know the population is 100,000, so let's put that in. So 100,000. Our model for the population is 50,000 times 1.025. You have to use x as your variable. Let's adjust our window. So x is time. What's the smallest amount of time that could go by in this problem? One year. Uh, even smaller than one. Zero. Zero. You could have no time that goes by, and then the answer would be 50,000. Uh, the maximum amount of time that goes by, there is no maximum. Let's set this at least to 50 years, and hopefully that's enough time for the population to, to basically double. That's what you're figuring out. When will the population double? Um, what's the smallest amount of people that we can have in this problem? 50,000. 50, We're assuming it's growing the whole time. And we want to know when it hits 100,000, so let's, let's go to 120. So there's a line at 100. Here's the model of my population. It's a little hard to see, but it is a curve. It's not linear. It's curving up. And what do you think I have to find? Intersect. Intersect. Second calc intersect. Okay. So it is going to take about 28.07 years. We could figure that out algebraically. What's that? We could have figured that out algebraically, correct? If you know how to do logarithms, yes. If you don't know how to do a logarithm, then not yet. But that will be something we will learn at some point. Absolutely, this can be done algebraically. A yep. little bit harder to do algebraically because if you look at your equation, your equation has a variable in the exponent. You have to know how to get a variable out of an exponent which is not something you learn in algebra one. But I do too, you do. Okay, so any questions on the model or the answer to when we hit 100,000? Okay. So remember, as always, be careful when you set up a window about including negatives. A lot of times negatives don't make sense. Negative money, negative time, things like that. And now we're gonna look at a very specific kind of exponential growth, which is doubling. Okay, something doubling every, say, doubling every hour. Let's say we started with 100 bacteria, and that's going to double every hour. How much bacteria do we have at time zero? How much? 100. How much bacteria do we have after one hour has gone by? 200. We have 200. Now, 
you can kind of figure that part out. That part's easy, right? 100, 200, 400, 800. I want to think of this 200, though, in terms of the base and in terms of doubling. So we started with 100. That was the initial amount times 2. And what exponent could you put right here to make this formula work for our number 1? Um, 1. So that's really, think of it as like 100 times 2 to the 1. How could you think of the 1 below it? So what do you think I have under here? 100 times 2 to the second. 100 times 2 to the second. And how about this one? 100 times 2 to the third. 100 times 2 to the third. So what about in general? 100 times 2 to the t. And the 100 is your initial amount, which could be anything. So the formula in general for something doubling is your initial amount times 2 to the t divided by the length of time to double. So you might think, well, wait, we didn't really do that. We, we did. What was the length of the time to double in this problem? One hour. One hour. So I didn't really have to think about this denominator because it was a 1. But this needs to represent the number of doubling periods that have gone by. That's what that number needs to represent. So that box in red is the number of doubling periods. Think about something, let's do something simple. Something that doubled every 10 days. At the end of 30 days, how many times has it doubled? It's doubled three times. Double, 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 right? Which means you end up with how much compared to what you started with? Eight times the amount. So if something doubled every 10 days, after 30 days, it will have doubled three times. You would want that exponent to be a 3, because that would indicate, OK, 2 times 2 times 2. Double, double, double. If you said, well, it doubles every 10 days, I'm just going to write 2 to the 10th. I'm not going to put the divide by 30. Or I'm not going to put, no, what did I say? Uh, oh yeah, I said it was 30 days. If you just say, well, I'm just going to do 2 to the 30, and I'm going to forget that he said it doubles every 10 days. I'm not going to divide that by 10. What you're saying here is double it 30 times. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. Well, in 30 days, it doesn't double 30 times. It's not doubling every day. It's only doubling every 10 days. So that's why you have to divide by the length of the time to double. So uh, let's look at this. 100 bacteria in a Petri dish doubles every hour. When will there be 350,000? All right, so let's write a formula for the amount of bacteria. Uh, how do I want to write this? Let's write it like this. The amount as a function of time. What's the first thing I write down? 100. 100, that's my initial amount, times. What do we always put in the parentheses if it's a doubling problem? Two. 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 And what is my exponent going to be? T divided by the length of time to double, which in this case is what? Just an hour. Just an hour. So I don't need to put divide by one. But there's your formula. If seven hours go by, plug in a seven, and you can figure out how much bacteria you have. They want to know when we would have 350,000. It's kind of like the population problem. Where would the 350,000 go? The A T. Yeah. And you'd calculate an intersect. Okay, so that's how you do uh, a doubling problem. 
And then the last one is what we call a half-life problem. It's the opposite of doubling. Instead of something growing each time, it's having each time. So one place that this is used is with like radioactive uh, material. Right? Radioactive material is, is poisonous, and a lot of radioactive material has a half-life. So let's say that today we have 1,000 units of radioactive material. And if the half-life was a day, then that means tomorrow we'll have 500 units of radioactive material. And then the day after that, we'll have 250. And the day after that, we'll have 125. Radioactive materials usually have a very long half-life. That's why if you look at anywhere where there's been a nuclear uh, disaster, it can take 20, 30, 50, 100 years before all the radioactive poisonous stuff decays enough that it's safe for people to go back. Right? And half-life formula works very similar to a growth one. You have an initial amount, except for half-life, you use one half instead of two, and your exponent is still the same. But because this base is less than one, a half-life problem is going to look like this. You're going to see the amount of your substance decaying over time, but never reaching zero. So that technically means anytime we create nuclear waste, it's never gone. There's always a little bit left. Eventually it's so little it doesn't really matter, but it, there's always a little bit left. So if we need to, we can, uh, we can go through one in the homework tomorrow. That's an exponential decay. But it basically involves setting up your formula, putting something in y1, y2, and finding an intersect. Yeah? I mean, so it would be the same thing for tripling and quadrupling, right? We just put a 3 in that spot. And uh, yeah, you can set up a formula for tripling or quadrupling. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So those are the questions for tonight. Okay, we'll go over that tomorrow. Uh, reminder that we'll finish up uh, our material for the week tomorrow. I'll be after school for extra help tomorrow. And if anybody needs to um, talk to me about their grade for uh, term one, uh, please feel free to come by and we can, we can take a look at that.